Hi, in this Let's Create series we're creating a jigsaw puzzle game like this. In the last episode we scattered our pieces around the board and created a border to assemble the puzzle in, and this episode we'll implement the dragging mechanic so you can assemble the puzzle, and also a snapping mechanism to make sure those pieces go into exactly the right place, and finally when you complete the game a restart mechanic so you can solve the next one. Let's get started. Let's start off very simply with the drag functionality. We'll add a new update method, which is called once per frame. In this, we check if the left mouse button is pressed using input.getMouseButton down and passing in zero the left button. When we do that, we want to check if there is a piece underneath the mouse cursor. To do that, we can send a physics raycast out from our position and see if it collides with any of our pieces. We use physics2d.raycast to send the ray. This needs to know the origination point of the raycast. This is simply our mouse position, which we get with input.mouseposition. However, that mouse position is in screen coordinates rather than world coordinates. So we use camera.main.screen to world point to convert it for us. The second parameter to the raycast is in which direction you want to send it. We want to send it straight into the screen, so this is just vector2.0. We need to store the result of the raycast, and that is of type raycast hit 2D, which we'll call hit. Now we've sent out the ray and have a hit object, we just need to check if it's actually hit anything. We use if hit to do this. This will be null if nothing was hit, and thus the if statement would evaluate to false. If we did hit an object, we need to record which object it was so we can move it. So add a new global variable of type private transform called dragging piece, which we set to null to indicate there is nothing selected. We can then set this using hit.transform. That takes care of the initial mouse down, so whilst it's held down, we want to update its position relative to the mouse position. Inside our update, we thus need another if statement. If we have a dragging piece defined, then we want to set the new position to the position of the mouse. Again, we can use the screen to world point function on the camera to convert the mouse position to world coordinates. We can then simply set the dragging piece position to be this new position. If you were to try this out now, you'd see that when you click on the pieces, they disappear. This is because the z axis position returned by the mouse position will be equal to the z position on the camera because that's where we calculated it. So we just need to override this and set it to the dragging piece position. This will ensure that remains unchanged. The final state is when we release the mouse button. We only need to set it to null if it's already set, that is, if we are dragging a piece, and we are releasing the mouse button. So this time we use get mouse button up, again passing in zero for our left mouse button. Then to stop the dragging, we simply set our dragging piece to null, then our update logic has nothing to update. Now back in Unity, we just need to make one change to our game piece prefab for this to work. As we used a quad by default, it added a mesh collider. This interacts with the 3D physics engine. However, we just implemented it with 2D. Because we're only operating in the XY plane, we didn't need to complicate that with Z. So all we need to do is remove the mesh collider and then add a box collider 2D. That will be able to detect our Raycast 2D ray. Pressing play, we can check this out. We can now click and drag on the items. You'll notice one strange effect. When you click on a piece, it'll jump to the cursor position no matter where you click on the object. This is usable, but it's not the expected behavior. If you grab, say, the top left corner, we expect that to stay under the mouse as we move it. So let's jump back into the code to sort that out. The key here is to store the offset between where you clicked and the center of the piece, so you can maintain that. So add a new global private vector three called offset. Now, when the raycast has hit and we record the piece transform, we can also record the offset. So set offset equal to the dragging piece dot position minus the position of the mouse. So if you click directly in the center, this will be zero and have no effect. But if you click towards the edge, it will record that difference. In the code we run when dragging, we just need to apply this offset. 
One nice side effect of this is that the offset isn't just in the x and y direction, but includes the z also. This means we can get rid of our previous hack to fix the z value. Instead, we can simply update the new position by adding on the offset we wish to preserve. That's it, we're nearly there now. Back in Unity, we can see that it doesn't matter where you click on the game piece, you drag from that location. There is one final oddity we wish to rectify. You'll note that when dragging a piece, the piece you are holding may move underneath others. When you pick up a piece, you expect that it always to be visible because you're dragging it over the others to move it. We can solve this by a one simple addition to the code. To our offset, we'll add vector3.back to it. This will pull it towards our camera one unit. Given how we've set up all the objects to date, that'll be enough to ensure it's on top of everything. We just need to make sure that when we stop dragging, we put it back again. So before setting dragging piece to null, we update the position to add on vector3.forwards, which undoes the vector3.back we added on to start with. Back in Unity again, we can see this working. It's much nicer and we can begin to assemble the puzzle. You will note that when you drop the piece, it goes back to its original sort order. I'm okay with that, so I'm going to leave it like this for now. If you always want the piece to be on top when you drop it, then either you could do a naive implementation, where you drop the piece at the highest Z value and then just keep increasing that each time, or you could check the pieces which are around it and just make sure that the one you're dropping is, has the highest Z value. That's a polishing detail, not a core game mechanic, so I'll leave that up to you. I've essentially finished the puzzle now, but it's not looking great. Try as I might, I'm not going to get each of those pieces exactly where they need to go. So we're going to implement a snapping mechanism that puts the piece exactly in the right spot if you get it close enough. To do this, we need to create a new method we'll call when we release the mouse button. So add a call to our new method, snap and disable if correct, and now we'll create this. The first thing we need to do is find out which piece we have been dragging. All we actually need to know is the index of the piece in our pieces array, which we can get using pieces.indexOf and passing in our dragging piece. This is because the index of the piece determines where we placed it. So we can use that to tell where it goes. What we'll do is convert this index into a row and column. The column is the index modulus the x dimension, modulus remember gives us the remainder of a division, and row is the index divided by the x dimension, i.e. the whole number of columns we've completed. Using that we can calculate the target position. This is exactly the same as the code we used in create jigsaw pieces when we set the initial position before we scrambled the puzzle. Which makes sense because that's where we want the piece to end up again. To run through it quickly again, the x coordinate is the left edge of the puzzle, which is negative width times dimensions.x divided by 2, plus width times however many columns we go through. Then width divided by 2 because we're centering the pieces. The y coordinate is the same for height and row. Now all we need to do is check if the distance between our piece's local position and the target position is within some threshold. I've used width divided by 2 here, which is fairly generous. You can make it smaller to make the puzzle a bit harder. Note that I've used local position here. This is because our target position was defined as a local position, so we ignore the scaling of the game holder. If that inequality is satisfied, we snap the piece to the exact location. So set its local position to the target position. The last thing to do is to stop us being able to move it again, because now it's in the right position, why would you? This, I guess, is technically optional, but I much prefer the game working like this. So to do this, we get the box collider 2D component using get component and just set enable to false. We can't disable the game object because that would remove the image, but by disabling the box collider, it will no longer be clickable. Thus, you'll not be able to select it again. Let's check that out. As you can see, the pieces are snapping into place when I get them roughly in the right place, and they cannot be moved again. The last thing to finish off the core game mechanic is a way to detect the puzzle completion. We'll implement a simple counting mechanism to achieve this. So, to the global variables, we'll add two things. First, in our UI elements section, we'll add a new serialized field for a game object called play again button. We'll show this when we've completed the puzzle. 
Then add a new private int called pieces correct. We want the number of pieces correct to always start at zero. So at the end of the start game method, after we've initialized everything, we can just set pieces correct to zero. In order to detect when we finish, we need to increase the pieces correct count each time we get one right. So in our snap and disable if correct method, after we've disabled the bots collider, we can increment the number of pieces correct. Then using an if statement, we'll check if the pieces correct equals the pieces dot count. That is the number of pieces in our pieces array. If that's true, then we'll show the play again button by using set active and pressing in true because we've completed the puzzle. We'll jump back into Unity and create that button in a second. But first, let's just create the function that button will call. This will be to reset the puzzle and show the main menu. We'll call this restart game. Note that this time it's a public method because we need it to be accessible from the button. The first thing to do is to remove all of our puzzle pieces. So we have a for each loop to loop over each of the pieces, which we were stored as a list of transforms. And so for each of these, we call destroy on the game object associated with them. That will remove the objects from our scene. And then we call pieces.clear to remove all the references from our list of pieces because they're not there anymore. We need to hide the line renderer. We didn't save that to a global variable. So we'll just get it from the game holder by calling get component and set the enabled property to false. Finally, we need to show the level select panel. So we hide the play again button by using set active and passing in false. And we show the level select panel by calling set active and passing in true. Note that for the level select panel, we have a reference to the transform. So we need the game object in the call here to get that. That's it, all done. Now back in Unity, we want to add the play again button. Right click on the canvas and in UI, we'll select the button. This version of Unity I'm using uses Text Mesh Pro for all buttons now, so you'll get this pop up. Just import the Text Mesh Pro Essentials and then you can close the dialog. So use Shift F to focus on the canvas so you can see where the button will go. If we click on the positioning widget, then hold down Alt to set both the pivot and the position to the bottom. This will put the button right at the bottom, so let's just move it up a little bit. So set Y to 50 and we'll just increase the size of the button slightly. Then if you expand the button element and select the text object, we can change the text. I set this to play again. If we go to the game manager object, we can now put the reference to this button on there by dragging it onto the correct spot. Back on the button again, we can set what happens when we click it. So scroll down in the inspector to the on click definition. We drag the game manager as the object which contains the function we want to run and we select the game manager script and the restart game function. If this doesn't appear for you, make sure you remember to set the function to public. Finally, on the button, we disable it to start with as we only want it to show when you finish the puzzle. Now we can play the game and check this out. Here's a speeded up version of me solving the house puzzle. As you can see at the end, the play button appears at the bottom. When you click on that, you're shown the puzzle selection screen again, and you can see in the inspector on the left that all of the old puzzle pieces have been deleted from the game holder. Now you can select another puzzle and carry on solving. That's it. There you have the core game mechanics to build your very own jigsaw puzzle game in Unity. If you're looking for some ideas of what to try next, I suggest a difficulty slider to adjust the number of pieces in the puzzle. I hope you found this tutorial useful in some way. As ever, the full code is on GitHub and linked in the description below. See you next time.